1201. <clears throat> and um, we have 101 participants. So we'll, we'll stick with the 101, right? That's where we begin is 101, less than 101. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna have a really <clears throat> exciting afternoon. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about how this all came to, to be. Thanks to my friend, uh, Rija Joy. Uh, out in uh, Omaha, um, <clears throat> Peter Panagor called me about five weeks ago, something like that, and said that he had been told to call me and that we should chat a little bit. And we started chatting. chatting. And, um, he told me about this uh, really profound mystical near-death experience that he had. And I had a death experience in 1976 myself. And I read his book, uh, which is uh, Heaven is Beautiful. And if you've not read it, I highly recommend that you do read it. And I was just uh, amazed at some of the similarities, as I said. Also, a number of differences. But that's, uh, that's the same with anybody else near death experiences. There are going to be interesting overlaps, and there will be differences as well. Um, but Rija was encouraging uh, Peter to begin to become involved. Uh, with a course in miracles and that he should call me, which is what he did. And then after reading his book, I said, I've got to have him come on um, up until March of this year or through March 8th of this year. I did something in New York City that was called Miracles in Manhattan. And we all know why that came to an end. There are no meetings in Manhattan of uh, groups of people going on. And so uh, that was in March. I realized that April was Easter and um, I wanted to do something. So I got a bunch of Course in Miracles uh, student teachers to come together and we put Easter service, a three hour service together uh, with 800 some odd people. <clears throat> and I realized that I would not be going back into New York City. And so I'm going to stick with the second Sunday of the month. It's going to be Sunday with Monday live. I also send out a little uh, epistle, a little uh, inspirational thing on Sunday mornings. Uh, um, but we'll stick with this being one time a month that I'll come together like this. And there's a lot to go over. Let me see if I can go over the, I'm going to do the share screen. So, Let's go down. Let's just sort of little. I'm going to introduce uh, Reverend Bud in a moment. Uh, Reverend Dr. Bud, he's a graduate of the All Faith Seminary here in New York. If my assistant Eileen is on. I'd like for her to at least wave and say hi. Hello. I want to introduce you to Mark Laux, who's going to be giving a little commentary after uh, Peter and I have talked, and then also Dr. Rod Shelberg, who's going to give a little commentary after Rod and I have talked. And uh, Rod, by the way, is the author of this book here, which is called When God Calls Say Yes. And then um, Peter and I are going to do the first hour pretty much just in dialogue. And then there are more reflections from Mark and from Rod, and then we'll open them to everyone. And I think that's about it. Oh, let me just tell you a little bit about what's coming up <clears throat> with these Sundays with Monday. In October, it's going to be my good friend, uh, Dave Fishman, or Dove Fishman, who's the, my, we both are with, with the One Mind Foundation here in New York. And then Aaron Apkin, or whether maybe you've been Aaron Apkin or not, <clears throat> he's just a young guy who's um, gotten very into the Course in Miracles and uh, is just getting huge crowds coming to his uh, YouTubes online. And then in December, Dr. Robert, Robert Rosenthal, who is a co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace, which published uh, Helen's uh, version of The Course in Miracles. I want to introduce a couple of uh, Mark um, Lauchs, just for a second. Uh, Mark is a Course in Miracles leader in uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I found Mark, uh, we found each other in Mar July of last year when I was going around giving lectures up in uh, Michigan, uh, also at that time in Wisconsin. And um, 
he was one of those guys that just like sitting there paying incredible attention to everything that was going on and nodding his head. And, and uh, it, was, it was really, really clear that he was uh, deep into this uh, understanding of the Course of Miracles. And the way we're going to do today is Peter and I are going to do until one o'clock and then Mark's going to come on for about a half hour or an hour, not half hour, more like 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes of making some observations based on his experience. He's not had a near death experience, but um, he's uh, a mystic. We're all mystics. And he has had experiences that I think are so relevant to what we're talking about today that I wanted him to share. And uh, so just wait. Hi, Mark. Uh, uh, Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here, Mark. I appreciate this. And then also Dr. Rod. Uh, can you uh, we'll get, get so a little bit about Dr. Rod Shelberg. Uh, Dr. Rod and I have been friends for about 10 years now. Um, we've got together with uh, Marie Perrone and suggested that we should talk. Marie is the uh, author of A Course of Love. And uh, it's just been wonderful getting to know Rod over the years. He was an ER doc for 15 years. Uh, then for about five or six years, he was in charge of four nursing homes and also a, a hospice center and had a number of experiences of a really psychic nature. And also he's really the, the person you wanna be with you by your bed uh, when you're deciding to, to leave this body. So I'm gonna ask Rod Rod, say hello or wave your hand or wherever you are if you can. I do Please exist. Just on screen for a sec. There he is. Okay. Hello. Hi. Thank Rod. you, everybody. Hi. He's now got a, a cast on his foot from a <laughs> recent operation, right? Anyhow, I'm asking Rod to also make about 10 minutes worth of observations. Then from that time on, we will just be working with questions and observations that you've made which you have sent to bud so bud will select which ones of those that are kind of relevant to what we're doing and offer them and then we can save some time toward the end where we just open the floor for chatting if necessary i have a few slides that i want to share um, after peter has done his initial presentation which shows you some of the overlaps between Peter's experience and my own experience. And um, I think without further ado, let's go to Peter Panagor. Peter, let me just introduce Peter a little bit. As I said, we just met a few weeks ago, but uh, Peter had a near-death experience as a result of trying to do an ice climb in uh, the Rockies up in Canada and um, they got up there kind of late and uh, couldn't get back down in time before evening. Uh, kind of was on a ledge, uh, separated from his partner and froze to death. And then he had this experience, uh, which we'll be talking about. And now he's getting interested at the encouragement of uh, Reach of Joy and others to study A Course in Miracles because the Course has so much to say that sounds so similar. Actually, uh, I wrote a book a few years back, uh, also about my, my death experiences, and it's called Eternal Life and A Course in Miracles. And I didn't put the title of the experience on the cover or anything like that, but I called it Holy Hell. And the reason it was Holy Hell was because it was the last thing I said before I left here <laughs> in terms of what I was seeing. It was holy because of what came out of it. It was hellish in terms of on an ego level, on an ego level, uh, let go that I had to engage in. That I think, I don't mean to scare people, but it, this is a, it's a good thing really, it's a purification. It's getting us uh, free of the illusion and back into reality. So without further ado, Peter, are you here? Can you come on and begin to chat with us? Yes, I am. Hello. Okay, Can great. It's sure so about uh, 11, 12.35 or so, okay? Tell us what happened. Oh, well, um, as you, as John said, I was ice climbing and it was my first ice climb, but I want to emphasize it's not my first winter experience. I was in the National Ski Patrol. I'd been since I was a sophomore in high school and I'd been a Boy Scout my whole life and therefore spent much of my life uh, right up into the time of this incident backpacking and climbing all over New England in particular, but that year in Montana, Wyoming, Alberta, 
and British Columbia. And what happened is, is that my new partner, my new climbing back country partner, Tim, and I went out for a 10 day trip, snow caving, had a wonderful time. And, and we were on back, we were on skis with 70 pound packs and we skied way out into the wilderness and we dug snow caves and we slept in them and we skied every day. And then we went on an ice climb. Uh, I'd never been ice climbing before, but I'd geared up for it. Tim was a experienced lead climber, certified experienced lead climber. And I'd been rock climbing before plenty of times, had done uh, quite a number of faces, but never ice. And I couldn't come up with all the gear that I needed. And I came up with an ax and a hammer. And you're supposed to climb with two axes, uh, but I didn't have two axes. So as a, you know, a young man, 21 years old, I can do this. I used an ax in one hand and a hammer in the other. But what that meant was uh, you could rest with an axe. You could suspend yourself on a strap around your wrist. Uh, the strap went up three quarters of the, a third of the way up the shaft, slide a little bead down this nylon strap, and you could just hang on this thing. Well, you know, plan it and hang. But with a hammer, the strap comes out the bottom, and it's really not meant for climbing. You can use it for climbing, but it's meant for putting in ice screws and taking out ice screws and chipping away at the ice to set the screw in. And so I climbed with this. And as a result, I could never rest the, my arm. And so I burned out my, my muscles and my forearms very quickly. And it slowed our climb down significantly. And we weren't the only team on the ice that day. Another dozen teams finished before us and were leaving, had already descended, packed their gear and were walking out as the sun was beginning to set and we were still at the top of the climb about 600 feet up. I'll spare you all of the, the details of the hyperthermia that occurred between that point and when I died. And what happened when I died, we were uh, one rappel length up from the ground on the sheer face. I had a rope tied to my harness. I had tossed the rope out to the side, it got stuck I was going to pull it through, toss one end out to the side. And through the last stages of hypothermia as we were stuck there. And the last stage of hypothermia, um, the second last stage is falling asleep. Uh, I woke up from my re repetitive sleep pattern. I would sleep and I would fall and smack into the rock and stand up again. And I stood up again and here was the last stage. The last stage was... Uh, tunnel vision, where my peripheral vision was wide and came to a close, and I watched it as it closed down, closed down, and darkness, and I thought to myself, why am I still awake? Why am I not in pain? Where, what's going on? I, 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 I don't understand, and immediately as I was running through these, these thoughts in my mind very quickly, suddenly my I was thinking, I, I should say that I, I was thinking about the mountain. The mountain should be, I should be able to see the mountain if my eyes are open. I felt like I could see, but my, I knew my eyes were shut. But suddenly I could see an, an, an eternal darkness that stretched into an infinity. And it was uh, like an opening in front of me. And way far, far, infinitely far away was a pinprick of light that was the size of a pinprick and it came rushing toward me from an infinite distance faster than the speed of light, faster than thought, and it got larger as it came toward me and it began to fill the space and it, it, it said to me telepathically, non-linguistically, I'm taking you and I had this immediate sense of super intelligence and super power and uh, it took me against my will. I tried to resist and it plucked me, pop, I was out. And I was then immediately enwrapped and enfolded inside this being. And I could say that it was, a, I say, I call it my angel. Everything I say from here on out is metaphor because this is the place of non-being where there are no things there and no brain and no concepts and no language. So in order to talk about it, I have to use like all mystics throughout the history of the world, metaphor, including Jesus. Jesus was a code switcher, speaking two languages at once, metaphor and Aramaic. So anyway, I get plucked out of myself. I'm suddenly enwrapped inside of this. I am completely powerless. 
and I'm okay with being powerless. I am suddenly comforted. I'm suddenly feel that I feel not full yet, but at ease. And I get carried up the tunnel. The, but the, the vast darkness was still vast and infinite, but it also collapsed into a tunnel at the same time. Duality, uh, pardon me, paradox, both large and small at the same time. And I was carried up the tunnel that was collapsing into a tighter and tighter space. And I don't know whether I popped out of this angelic intelligence or, I, or it opened itself and became the eternal itself. I can't tell you which happened. But suddenly I was inside the darkness itself, but the darkness was illuminated. And I could see in every direction at once, and all I could see was eternity, an infinity of timelessness. And my first experience of myself was sort of self-reflective, and I had no body left. There were, I was a no thing. I was in a place of no, nothing. There was nothing here, no things. And I was no thing. And I was, I described myself as an orb of consciousness, but I could describe myself as a, as a bucket of, of water. I could describe myself as a, as a, as a balloon. Or, but I was a not thing. And all of my consciousness, my sensations, and my intellect and my sense of self were no longer separate. They were all one thing. My, my sense of myself was the same of my th as my thinking about myself was the same as my seeing all of the eternity around me. No separation. And I, my first self-reflection was, this is who I am. How did I forget who I am? Now I remember this is me. This is me. And I was comfortable. I was in comfort and I was comfortable and I was fearless. The fear, I, I was myself again and I knew it. And then all, and I'm in timelessness and all these things that I'm about to say, including what I just said, happened in a state of timelessness, which is like all time, not just in a linear time, but like all time in all these different other directions. But there was all time all at once, but it was also the, an eternal now. So like all time existed and all time existed now. Again, a paradox. And I was in this timeless space, and this is what happened to me. I heard my name called, my soul name called, only it wasn't Peter. It was the essence of the origin of the calling of my being into being. It was my beingness of being. It was my, my singular self that was called eons and eons ago into creation and also called immediately now, ancient and present. And I could see myself be called into being. And I was like a singular photon, a superpositioned, a wave and a particle. And I was superpositioned inside of the, of the unity of the oneness of being, and, which was unlimited photons, unlimitedness. And I was both part of that and not part of that. I was both same substance of it, but not the same substance because I was limited and created and I was in the presence of creator and creator communicated to me. I am the all and the all of all being and you are my creature. I made you, I called you by name into being and my name is as ineffable as God is truly ineffable. And I could see the long tail of my soul, which is what I constructed and call it, but it was, but it's, it, it seemed to me to be this eons long essence of myself beginning at the at the point of my creation uh, and i could see like permeations or permutations of myself living lives and was it previous lives or is it simultaneous lives i don't know and i'm not really interested because none of them were me I knew that my beingness, my, my selfness was my createdness being called into being the nameless, the unspeakable name by the unspeakable one -ness of being. And I could, all of this is happening at once. And I also, though, could, I could also experience um, the, the, uh, like a portal opened in front of me all at the same time. And this portal was this, was this flowing, essence of uh, translucent, transparent, and 
uh, also solid, but it was flowing and moving and it opened into a much longer tunnel that went much further in. And as I touched this water of life, this pearly gate, this flow of the living presence of God, as I reached and touched this to discover what it was with my soul self, with my orb of being, it became the all in all and expressed itself inside of me and rushed into me. And I was enveloped in the light itself. And it was the light itself. And, it, and, and at that point is when the, I could see my soul created by creator. And I could also simultaneously experience all of the pain that I'd ever caused in my entire life. Like John, I had a hellish experience, but it was a hell that I had created like Jacob Marley in a Christmas Carol where I, these chains I forged in life, rattle, rattle, rattle. I forged my own hell, all the pain that I gave away in my life. I gave to myself karma. As I gave the pain away, I gave it to myself. And I experienced my life review was going through all of the pain that I'd ever given away for to intentionally given away. Like I meant to hurt people as we do as humans and all the pain I had unintendedly give it away. The pain I didn't mean and didn't know that I'd caused. And from, I experienced the pain that I gave them from their point of view, but at the magnitude of 10,000 times, the amount that I thought that I gave them. I gave to myself juxtaposed to my own justifications for causing them their pain. And I self judged as shameful and guilty. And the voice, capital T, capital V, the voice with no sound reverberated from infinity and inside of me and outside next to me and said without language, I love you. I made you. I know you. I've always known you. There's nothing about you that is unknown to me. And love flooded into me. And at the same time, I could see all of humanity. And I could see the limited nature of our corporeal selves. Made broken as the universe itself is broken. As black holes consume entire galaxies, as microbes consume smaller microbes. Everything is broken here and consumes itself. And it was not badness. This was not negativity. It was merely limitedness. The limited nature of all the world and all humanity in it, the voice was saying to me, it's not your fault that you caused this suffering. I love you. I know you. It's not your fault because it is the structure of the entire universe. Every human being is limited. There's an equality of limitedness. And there was no comparison between my sins and the sins of anyone else because there was an equality of limitedness in comparison to the unbalanced, unlimited, unbalanced perspective. Like, like limitedness is so small and unlimitedness is infinite. And so the perspective was between limitedness and unlimitedness. And I was breathed into, I love you. I made you. I know you. I've known you. I forgive you. You're my creature. I'm creator. I love you. And it seemed to me that all the love that I had ever given in my life away and all the love that had given to me in my life, that was my key to seeing the light itself. That was my key to, to being able in the midst of my shame and my guilt for having caused pain that was not my fault and yet I was guilty of. Turned my eyes to the divine, my eye to the divine. And that love infilled me and flooded me with a oneness of being that is inexplicable. It's like here in this world, we have experienced all these fragmentations of love and I, beauty, truth, knowledge, understanding, intelligence, bliss, wholeness, healing, adoration, awe, joy, and peace, and all of these things that we experience, the higher parts of our lives, the higher spiritual parts of our lives, they were all one thing, one thing, and it infilled me. And it infilled me to my 10,000, I was 10,000 times bigger than I am. 
in this life. My soul is much larger than my body. And if I, I was in flooded with this oneness of being, in flooded with the light itself to the point at which a single drop more, it felt like I would obliterate. I would obliterate and fall and cascade into the oneness of being in totality with no longer a sense of self. And I was in adoration. And, and my sense of Peter vanished. All my suffering was gone. And I said, without language, am I dead? And the voice said, yes, you're dead. I said, I can't go now. And the voice said, why not? And I said, well, my parents are suffering. The, my sister ran away. She vanished. And my mom had a breakdown. And my dad was angry. And it lasted 10 years. And I can't take another child from them. It'll devastate them. And in that moment, I was swept across heaven, across the universe, and to the edge of the intersection of heaven and earth. And I could peer down on all earth like a hologram, and I could see 7 billion people in the very moment of my viewing that night. And I could see all of them in clarity and what everyone was doing. And they were all covered by a veil of forgetfulness. And the voice said to me, in the way that I love you now, eternally, always, infinitely, I love you always, and I love everyone that way. And my love always was, always is, and always will be infinite for you. And you, Peter, are my particular beloved one. And so is every other person that you can see, my particular beloved one, everyone individually so, all covered with the veil. Nobody can see what I can see, the totality of the experience of the love of being this. This love that is, is a trillion times, a trillion times greater than anything I can ever tell you, that, that, that re reverberates through my life even here in this world. And, and the voice showed me my parents' lives and their faces and their suffering in the moment, but they also, he all got God, not he, God, pardon the patriarchal language. God has no gender. God had no religion. Everything I say is metaphor. The, I could see the length of my parents' life from beginning to end without me and the suffering that they would endure. And the voice said, in the end, they will be as well as you are. And, the, and because of timelessness, they'll be here in a moment. And I said, but in the meanwhile, I see what's going to happen. Do I have to stay here? And the voice said, I want you to stay here. Come home to me. And I said, but I haven't gone all the way through the tunnel yet. And the voice said, no, you haven't. I said, well, do I have to stay? And the voice said, no, you don't have to stay. I want you to stay. I said, well, if I stay, if I go back, can I come back here? And to the oneness of being this infilling of heaven. And the voice said, yes, you can. And I said, I choose to live my life. And the voice said, you won't live your life and sent me back. And I had a choice of where I entered my life, what kind of life I would live. There were, there were a million probabilities and I could see them all. And like I chose an entry point, not in the, in the direct beam of the white light of beingness, but just off to the side. Because I remember thinking as I went, I like my sense of self. I want some sense of autonomy. And so I chose not quite the holiest route I could. And the next thing I knew I was being compressed and crushed and squeezed and turned and shoved back into this body. And the, my first sensation of the world was pain, suffering, because my body was in pain and my mind rose up through pain to my brain came online. I began to understand language because I could hear screaming and physicality. And it was my partner, Tim, screaming and yelling at me. And he helped me stand up after some period of time. I don't know how long. And when my ears came back completely and my brain was functioning, he said, you were dead. 
screaming, crying, you were dead. If you died, I was going to die. And he was in a panic. And I pulled on the rope because he told me to. And the rope came free. And we self-rescued. And that's my story up to that point. Well, Peter, <clears throat> there's just so many similarities between our two experiences. And I've created a few slides. I mean, there, we could go on all afternoon <laughs> about the overlaps. But uh, just a few highlights, and maybe we can talk about those. And uh, just, just listening to you again, like the old thing about wanting my old body back. <laughs> you know, that was a part I hadn't thought about before. And the veil of forgetfulness, that, that was all there, too. But let me see if I can show some slides, and then maybe we'll dialogue about these slides a little bit. So also, the, here's another similarity, Peter. Um, this is from my description, my experience. <clears throat> I can see in a completely 360 degrees and see, feel each space of depth in the sending gradations that focus a kind of telescopic vision that comes down on or opens up to a larger vision with amazing rapidity. So I thought this was very interesting that you too mm -hmm. talked about seeing in 360 degrees. You want to say something about that? Sure. When I was this sphere of no thingness, I, I was, it was as if I was 10,000 eyes or a single eye because I could see in every direction at once. I could see all, I couldn't see the end of infinity. Okay. I could see deep into infinity, but I couldn't see the end of it, but I could see a much larger scale of uh, visual intake than I could possibly do on earth. It, and also the telescopic vision thing, Mm -hmm. I, I, that's what I was looking at when I was seeing all the individual people on, on earth. Right. Uh, like this, this, like I could, I could see them individually telescopically. I could see the whole earth telescopically, but I also right. could see all of the individuals. Right. And it was like this kind of thing. Got it. Yeah. It was so amazing to be able to, you know, you're just sort of sitting back. You don't even know what's having the experience, but there's something that remembers the experience. Otherwise we couldn't talk about it. Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Because uh, the brain yeah, is. isn't present. And so how is it that I'm able to recall any of my experience when my brain was dead? And the, I've given that an awful lot of thought over the years. And my soul has a memory. My soul sure. knows. My soul inhabits my body. My soul is bigger and more powerful than my physical body. It's, it's not even made of material. And it has its own memory capacity. And in the interface between my soul and my body, there is where the veil thins, I see the remembrance of myself. And, and that's how I experience the divine. It's also how I experience the divine now. It's how I remember what happened to me. All right. So the course is very clear that the brain is just a, it's a computer. It's a part of the body, uh, but it has nothing to do with the, the soul at all. It's, it's a means of communication for us, but uh, in that sense, it's a kind of an instrument, but it's just a tool. All right. That's another place where, where I'm in alignment. Right. Let me go on with a couple more slides if I can. Um, and I should let everybody know I've not read The Course in Miracles. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on. So uh, here's, a, here's a quote from you, from your book, and then here's a quote from The Course in Miracles. So let me read first from Heaven is Beautiful and then from A Course in Miracles. On the other side, there are no things, no thing exists there. <clears throat> no time, no thing, nothing, no things. Words are things too. Words describe things. Words are symbols of symbols. And of course, the miracle says, let us not forget, however, that words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So what mm. every mystic is going to tell you, Peter already said a little bit, <clears throat> This is ineffable. You really can't talk about it. But here we are trying to talk about it. Because in trying to talk about it, maybe we get a little bit of a glimpse, a little bit of a feel for it. Because the truth of the matter is that all of us already know all this, according to the Course in Miracles. So what we're doing here is we're remembering, or word I like better, is recognizing 
what we already know. Mm -hmm. Peter, you want to comment on that? Sure, I like that recognizing thing. Yeah. So the words, when we talk about words, when, when you look at the color yellow and your eyes perceive yellow, it has no word attached to it. And so then we, we say, we'll give it a designation. And when we give it a designation, we give it a limitation. And that limitation is always in comparison to another limitation, blue or green. And we compare these things together. And language is, my experience of language is that the conceptualization happens at a visceral level. And then there's the level of conceptualization where we name things, like we, and, and then we say these things, so then we articulate these things. So it's like, just like The Course in Miracles, it's layer upon layer upon layer. And, and, and the, the construct, you probably all know this, that the, the, the culture of, say, Japan, uh, the Japanese is based in their language structure. The culture of, of, of the British is based in their language structure and or the culture of an aboriginal person is based on their language structure so their experience of the world is not only filtered through their senses it's filtered through the their conceptualization of the world so we're like separated 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 uh, and and language is this imperfect tool set with which we have thank god to communicate with each other but even in the worldly level it's impossible to use language in an accurate description. That's why we give names to things. Everything has, everything has a name except for God. The right. only unnameable thing. Nameless. All right. Cool. All right. All right. So let's talk about time for a moment. This is really interesting. So this is a course in miracles. So first I'm going to read you a quote from the course and then read a quote from Peter. Into eternity, probably a lot of you know this, is one of the major, maybe most frequently quoted lines in the Course. Into eternity, we're always one. There crept a tiny, mad idea. I wish the Son of God, that's you, <clears throat> remembered not to laugh. It is a joke to think that time could come to circumvent eternity, which means there is no time. And let me do one more now. And this is Peter. Time does not exist. Time exists here. This is from his book. Time moves forward here. We are look, we, and we look back in history and we think about time. Time is intertwined in nature, in the physics of the three-dimensional world. In time, there's a sequence of events. Here, one thing happens, and then the next thing happens, and then the next thing. On the other side, time does not exist. Nothing happens in sequence. Now, actually, the Course in Miracles, I'm going to come uh, out of this uh, and back to uh, the screen with you guys. <clears throat> Peter, you want to reflect on this a little bit, the time thing? Sure. Uh, the eternal now. The, the, the time and space, you probably all have, you know, time is intertwined with space in a physical sense. I don't know if you've all been following the, the Liger new uh, it's a it's a it's a telescope that measures gravitational waves when two black holes or two neutron stars collide they create gravitational waves if you've ever seen the the stretch of the universe it's like a like a a, a, a grid form where they've got a superstar a blue star that's very heavy and it sits on this this platform like this and it bends space and time space mm -hmm. and time bend around large objects that's why that's why telescopes optical telescopes work because there's this thing called gravitational lensing so that we can actually see behind other objects because time and space bends wow so when when two neutron stars or two black holes collide they they create a ripple of gravity and gravity ripples out like a wave through the universe and with this these these new tele this new telescope they can measure the bending of the universe of time the stretching of time and space and it happens all the time and now <laughs> and and now physics is catching up with the idea that time is a flexible thing in the universe 
And, and that's where I want to go with this. So the idea of a flexible time space, all time exists. It's not, it's not linear and hard even here. It's more wiggly like a noodle. Mm. In, in heaven, that noodle doesn't exist. So, so going from the linear idea of a fixed timeline to this bendable noodle in space to the place where there is neither space nor time. I'm trying to give you a step to the idea that time itself is not what you think it is here. And so in, in, in heaven, in the presence of the divine, inside of the beingness of God, all time exists at once. And it's not just this linear thing. It's, it's like all of these realities permeate or, or extend out of the, of, the, of, the, of the beingness of God, all these heavens, all these worlds, and all of them have their own time. Mm. And, and, and all of them exist inside of the all and the all, the oneness of being all at once. And so when I look back at, um, you know, whether I've been incarnated, which I saw, I, I am, other lives, I don't know whether they were happening simultaneously. They were happening simultaneous to my experience in heaven. Do they happen in a sequence? I don't know. I don't think so. They're all happening all at once. My mm -hmm. essence of beingness is always present. And I was called into being as a soul eternally ages ago, eons and eons ago, but I was also being created at the moment of my presence in the divine's presence. And so this, the idea is all time, no time, mostly no time. Right. Time itself, by definition, is sequence. Yes. Right. So we're talking about stepping out of sequence and into kind of simultaneity. Yes. Right. All things at once. The Course says that now is as close to he uh, eternity as to heaven as you can get right now. <laughs> and that's why meditation works. Because meditation quiets the, 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 the monkey mind, as it's to use the colloquial term, uh, in order to penetrate the silence of the nowness of being, because God's first language is silence and nowness. But the, the nowness here still runs in a sequence. It's, it's always now. So you can accumulate nowness in your meditative practice, <laughs> and it sticks to you, and it's always now, and you get more now. But you also practice the nowness in a sequence of time. But in heaven... There's no sequence of time. You know, the, the, the Course at several points refers to God as a presence. And, and that is when you see a capital P, yep. the presence, it's just presence. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I experience the, that's what I, I use that word too. Presence, yeah. With a capital P. I, uh, every time I talk about God um, or heaven, I, I capitalize it. Yeah, because, because, because can I can I mention words again? Because if I say if I say this stone is good, then how can I use the word good for the divine? If this right. is limited and God is unlimited, and so I I intentionally make this differentiation uh, grammatically, right? Punctuation, and uh, not punctuation, but capitalization. Sorry. Right. Let's just do a couple more slides. Uh... The, again, from Heaven is Beautiful and from the Course. This is another aspect of this. Every act of love accumulates in your soul. No one and no thing can take these from you or destroy them. Love is eternal and love is inside you. And then from the Course, your denial of its reality may arrest, <clears throat> may arrest it in time, but not in eternity. That is why your creations have not cease to be extended and why so much is waiting for your return. Now, the, the Course talks about this is the most basic law there is in the universe, okay? The most basic law there is in the universe is the law of cause and effect, i.e. what goes around comes around. Karma, Peter talked about karma in the first part of his presentation. And this, so this works in terms of, for example, the Course says you cannot hurt someone else and not hurt yourself. You hurt yourself because you're hurting somebody else. It's just it's like, because we're connected. We have to be totally connected. Right? On the other hand, uh, it, of course, it works the other way in terms of there's several times in the Course in Miracles where it talks about your creations. 
your creations are waiting for you. <laughs> it's like, the, I think the next slide I've got is, oh, let me show you that one, about what Jesus says about storing up treasures for ourselves in heaven. Mm. Nope, that's not, the guys, that's, that's not there. Okay, so uh, let's go back to Peter and see if you have any comment on this. Yeah, storing up your treasure in heaven. That's exactly what that means. And yes, it, exactly. It was, it, was an, it was an accumulation of love. And every what I created, unbeknownst to me, um, was my own hell, but also my own heaven, my own uh, capacity for, for getting. So the, l let me say that the, 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 the hell that I experienced, the divine fire of purgative love cleansed me. Love is what cleaned me. And what, what enabled me to accept, accept, which was overwhelming. I don't know if I could not have accepted because the, because the infinity of the pressure of the presence of the, of the bliss of love was so overwhelming. I'm, I don't think I could have done any other thing, but accept, but I could accept because of the treasure that I created on earth by accepting the love people gave me and by giving love away. And right. so every, all the love I gave away, I got to keep. And all the love that was given to me, I got to keep. And I, and I saw this, I saw this um, recent uh, video of a, I think it's a Muslim story. A woman dies and she uh, gets transported to, the to, to, to heaven, to a mountaintop. She's on a mountaintop and she's kneeling and she knows she's dead. And Muhammad appears to her. And, and he sticks his hand inside her heart and he pulls out her heart and it's a stone and a, and, a, and a balance scale appears and he drops the stone onto the scale and it goes, walk. Well, you just lost your sound, Peter. Sorry, then he reaches into his tunic and he pulls out a feather and he drops the feather on the scale and phew, the scale goes the other way. So the thing that is the darkness that I created for myself, the, the, ugly, the ugliness of my own behavior that was not my own fault because I was made in this universe. I didn't do that. Um, I didn't make it. Um, although it weighed a lot compared to the, to the power of the presence of the love of God and my complicity with love, complicity, complicity with love um i was cleansed and healed and sent home to the oneness of being and so the the treasure jesus also says out of the treasure of your heart you speak right. so it's also this treasure it not only accumulates in heaven this treasure accumulates in our heart and we live through this we live in the world through this. And that's the same way that, that the light of the being of the divine flow flows out into the world through us in the same way that it flows back from the world up into our heavenly storehouse of love, our heavenly, our heavenly treasure chest, because right. we're sticking other stuff up there too, besides love. That's why Jesus in Matthew says, store not for yourselves, church and everywhere, moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal. You know, that's what happens in this world, right? So we, get, we go for the treasures of this world, but the treasures of this world are nothing uh, compared to the treasures of love, which is what you're talking about. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, what I'd like to uh, do now is if, uh, to switch to uh, let Mark reflect for 10 minutes, and then we're going to let Rod reflect for 10 minutes, and then uh, we're going to all come back, and uh, Bud is going to share with us <clears throat> the major questions that he saw coming up. Mark, are you ready to step up? Sure. Yeah, I can reflect on it. Thank you so much, Peter and, uh, and John for your, uh, for sharing your experience. It's uh, pretty incredible. I do have to start by saying that I did not have a near death experience. My experiences are quite a bit different than that from that perspective. Um, I have had uh, mystical experiences that have come to me that have shown me heaven. And um, John, in your class, you say this quite a bit, and I think this probably sums it up for me pretty well. I have seen with Christ's vision and remembered God. In other words, for me, um, uh, that kind of came over me in a different way. Uh, and for me, it was also a gift. I didn't have to go through a near-death experience to get it. It was just given to me, which is... Um, really a blessing, but also in some ways 
pesopermiasis, some other things. When Peter was talking about it being metaphorical, that is exactly right. There are no words to describe um, anything that can be considered heaven or there's just no way to describe that in words. Uh, every time I do that, I fail miserably. And I'm a poet. I'm a writer. Fan, um, so I just struggle with that all the time myself. Um, it's not a thing. We are all one thing. I did have that experience. All of eternity um, was around me. Um, I like when Peter said, forget and remember. Uh, for me, my experiences were definitely around uh, remembering. Um, it was an ancient feeling. At the same time, it was perfectly clear as though it was happening so fresh and perfect that it can't be described again in words. But it was definitely a memory. Um, if I could interrupt you for a second, there's a there's sure. a line in the course where it says you must forget in order to remember. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and that and that is it, for me. A course in miracles. Um, I had my first few experiences before I read the course in miracles, and then after I've been studying course in miracles for the last twenty or so years. Um, I can say that I understand A course in miracles differently now than I did before, but I will also say that it is perfectly right. What Jesus is trying to say is exactly perfectly right in A Course in Miracles. Um, the timelessness, eternal now, that was definitely um, an experience that I had that was that's similar to Peter's. Um, I did not have God calling my name. Um, for me, the experience was that I was no longer Mark. Now, when I say that, uh, and I've had, <laughs> I've had a number of spiritual people talk to me about that and say, well, if you weren't Mark, who were you? I was in awareness. I, I was aware what was happening but I was not Mark. Mark had no frame of reference in heaven. You can't be Mark in heaven. You can't be John or anybody else in heaven. That just not, doesn't fit there. And when I say there's no frame of reference, um, I used to have a, a mentor, a spiritual mentor who passed away a few years ago. Uh, Connie, I think, John, you knew her too oh, as well. Yeah. She was a lovely woman. Yeah. But she used to say to me, <laughs> I've worked a long hard, long, hard time on being Connie. I don't want to give that up. And uh, <laughs> I can tell you, you will not miss it. You don't miss that at all. All right. Um, the ancient feeling, I want to go back to that because um, it's, um, you know, it's almost antediluvial. It's beyond before the flood. It's be before everything. It, um, but it does feel like a memory, and I love that. Um, I didn't have the um, feeling of I, that God knew me as much as it gave me the knowledge of God. And that was the moment, the first experience I had, that I stopped believing in God and became more knowledgeable. In other words, I gave up believing in God and it became a knowledge that I have, which is um, probably a little different for me um, there. No, no, I'm going to interject and say exactly the same. There is nothing that you have said so far that is any different from my experience. Absolutely. Um, and I would say, if you may interject, sure. this last thing is, um, you don't need to die to have a mystical experience of union. Right. Uh, I would agree because I didn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, soul is larger than the body. Um, what I experienced in my experiences was that there was no body. Um, there isn't a body. And uh, I, um, so that, that for me was uh, really clear. That's amazing, uh, the other, you know, of course. I mean, it says 62 times, I am not a body, I am free. Right, exactly. We're really trying to hammer that point home very clearly. Right. Um, the experience that Peter uh, talks about, um, about things being waved or um, all connected that way, I, I, my experience was like a blanket, and we're all part of a blanket. Um, mm. Essentially the same thing, I think, in a lot of ways. One thing that I would point out, um, I am not a special in any way. Um, one thing that was very clear for me was that, and I see this in every human being that I see now, and that's probably how things are different for me now bef than before I've had those experiences, is when I see you, John, as an example or anyone else, I know you have this also. In other words, there's nothing special about me at all. And um, so you will all get this. You just have to remember it all. Same. We're all already there, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, while you are all there, we just yeah, we just haven't re just haven't remembered it. That's all. Um, now we got a little bit lucky here, <laughs> right? Uh, when Peter said the blanket of forgiveness, forgetfulness, um, I see that all the time in people. When I look at them, I think, oh my goodness, sweetheart, if you could just see yourself the way God sees you, the way I see you now, you would never doubt yourself again. You can't because God mm -hmm. sees you the way God created you. 
in all its perfectness. There is nothing you've ever done or ever said or ever thought that can change any of that. You cannot change God's mind about what God created. Um, we do, though, create this body and make craziness. And we do... Um, the other thing that it showed me when I came back into my body or when I uh, wasn't really out of my body, I guess I wasn't, the body wasn't there. But when I came back into my body, one of the things that I thought was, um, oh my goodness, this is all such, so, so much pain here. <laughs> uh, so I agree with, uh, with Peter there as well. I, I was not frozen to death. I was just standing in my backyard or I was in a hotel room or I was, you know, literally just walking in a city street when these feelings come over me. Um, but I also realized that suffering is, is, is all temporary. It's just in the moment. But, but it also showed me that everything is pain. Like there is nothing here that isn't in a body. So uh, when Eckhart Tolle says stay in the pain body, um, I thoroughly agree with him. Just stay right there because uh, that essentially, if you, um, if you allow yourself to feel what you feel, it'll eventually come forward and you'll, you'll remember who you are. Um, I will also say that um, when you're in heaven, you will not miss anything here. You, you won't take it with you either, but you will not miss it at all. There's nothing here to hang on to. All of your desires here are all ephemeral. They will all go away. And um, my connection to my experiences has drawn that to me and it showed me that I, I don't quite honestly, I'm not really drawn to anything here any longer. Um, the only thing that draws me here is the relationships that I have of love with everyone around me and that's it. And um, so I didn't use all 10 minutes, but I would say thank you, Peter, for sharing that. That's very similar to my experiences, other than the fact that I didn't have to die to get there. And neither do you. In fact, that was the other thing, too, by the way. Uh, one more thing I will point out. There is no death. Um, that is an illusion. You can't die. That part of you that wasn't born and doesn't die is always. And it's because God created it. And you're an extension of God. You are um, connected to God always. You cannot not be. No matter how you feel about yourself, that's just not possible. So we we do that, but um, so I and one more thing too. Um, when I say I don't believe in God, belief um, is of the ego, um, mm -hmm. and understanding and knowledge is of God. And so when Peter said God knows everything, that's exactly right. It's super intelligent, but it's not intelligent the same way the ego would measure it by boy, I'm really good at science, or I know a lot of math. It's, right. it's more, um, the experience is, um, it's an all-knowing kind of a thing. I can't describe it in words. I wish that I could. I wish that I could just take you by the hand and, <laughs> and say, here, this is what it is, and give it to you. But the, the, other, the other part of this is you have to get there yourself. You, you must do that on your own. So right. thank hey, you so much for listening. When I, I entered, Mark, again, there's nothing that you said Everything you said completely agrees 100% with my experience. All of it, everything. Yeah, including us. And, 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 uh, and, and I, I, I want to say that we've never met before. We've never had a conversation before. And the reason, the reason why um, Mark and I experienced such a similar um, trip to heaven is because of God. Because this is the human experience. What he just described is the human experience of all of the great mystics in the history of the world, where sense of self is eliminated. And well, that's it. Sense of self is eliminated. Uh, so that's all I want to say is we're so similar. You know, let me say this. Uh, all mystical experiences are mystical experiences. They're not necessarily death experiences, but all death experiences are mystical experiences. Right on. It'd be very hard to have a death experience that didn't provide you with a mystical experience, but it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. I've done a couple of books on mysticism, mm -hmm. and there's just so many forms that, like, take nature mysticism, for example, right? I mean, just the fact of being in love when you're in nature or uh, loving with another person experience or something that happens in meditation that meditation you don't die to have this meditation experience you can kind of run down the list people have women have mystical experiences while giving birth 
mm-hmm. a lot of mystical, a lot of mystical experiences. This guy did this research at, at Oxford, huh, who found out that actually more mystical experiences seem to happen around like these dramatic events in life, like accidents, for mm-hmm. example, where you're you're out of your body, even though you're you don't necessarily go to heaven, but you know you do have this awareness of like watching, seeing what's going on, like kind of like you were describing. Exactly. Okay. Let's go to uh, Dr. Rod now, if we can. If Rod, are you available? And can you come and start sharing with us some of your observations? Can you hear me, John? I can hear you and see you. Great. You're right in the Beautiful. same. Great. Beautiful. So, about 10 minutes for you too, bro. All right. Well, I took the slow road to meeting God. I did not take the direct path of near-death experience. I used... Um, um, I had a, a rough crash and burn experience that kind of burned off a lot of the chaff in my life and opened up my mind. And I started reading A Course in Miracles and started meditating. And after several years, I started doing breath work exercises. And with that combination, I started to do what's called astral projection. And I started to get comfortable um, traveling around the universe and eventually. I went through the Milky Way, and and then I came to this um, very dark space, and I called it twilight because I didn't know what it was. But during this, I felt complete peace. I didn't hear anything. I didn't feel anything, just a complete peace. And I could look down on the Milky Way, and I came to the edge of that, and uh, and in front of me, there was this waterfall, this curtain of, of gray clouds coming down. And I thought, I want to go beyond that. I want to go see what's on the other side. Now, during all this traveling, um, I grew up Catholic. And and I eventually, by mutual agreement, left the Catholic Church in about seventh grade. And, And so I had a lot of this fear of God ingrained into me. But I could trust Christ because he felt like a brother. So Christ became a guide um, to me. So Christ would guide me through this, and I came to this this abyss, and, and I knew that I'm looking at this waterfall in front of me, and then I'm looking at this abyss, and I thought, if I go across this, I'm not going to make it, and I'm truly going to die. And I wanted to go. Well, in that instant, Christ reached through that waterfall and says, I'm going to catch you. So I went through that. And the, the waterfall is the curtain that everybody's talking about. And it's this very thin veil. And once I went through that curtain, I was stripped clean. And time and space ended. The concept of rod ended. The concept of a body ended. And I was just complete awareness. And I was pulled into a huge sphere of infinite dimensions of white light. Now, Christ didn't have any form. I didn't have any form, but I could feel the presence. We were we were melded as one, and we just floated floating through this. And Christ was very gentle with me. And eventually, after oh several months, he said, "Do you want to meet God?" And my Catholic fears started to come up, and I'm thinking maybe not a good idea. But I said, "I'm with Christ. How can that be a bad idea? He's here." So I surrendered all my concepts, my beliefs, whatever last little vestiges of thought that I had. And I stood there and I said, I want to meet you, Father. And in that instant, what I saw just briefly was just two misty arms, white arms, embrace me and pull me in, into his chest. And, and in that instant, everything was gone. My mind was completely expanded. I felt overwhelming love, overwhelming peace. Um, There was no communication. It was a knowingness, a feeling, and we are one, and I know who I am. Uh, There's no more doubt in my mind, and and I stayed that way um, probably for, I think, for a couple hours of just, because time is not there. It it just, it goes by. It feels like seconds, but I was left with, with you are my son, you are my holy child, you are pure, you are innocent, you are light. That is who you truly are. That's your divine essence. 
And just that liberated feeling, I too, like Peter, and like you, I, I could see 360 degrees into this white sphere of light. And it was just such a pleasant feeling. Um, I, I can go back there. And um, so what? then I started to go back into the body and it, it feels like I'm being crammed through a funnel of this infinite, infinite something crammed into this funnel and, and I'm into this painful body. And then it's the first thing is my bladder really needs to be taken care of. And then my arms are stiff and whatnot. But I learned, I learned that um, I, I can access that now just by meditating and getting very still. And um, it's when you're in that state, it's, it's a, there's nothing there and yet you feel wholly complete. It's contradictory and you feel complete oneness with God and completely taken care of. So one time I, I was asked that God said, you're done now. Do you want to stay? And I thought about that. And I thought, I would love to stay, but I want to come back and teach and help people to, um, to feel and find this for themselves. You know, what can I do to help heal the world? Peter talked about this telescopic vision. In some of my meditations now, I, I, I first tune into this oneness with God, and then I learn to step aside and this beautiful light comes out and I wash the world. I see the world as gray and it's, it needs help. And so I wash it with this light. And then I start seeing individual people um, coming by and, and I'm touching God, not me. God is touching them and, and they're, they're becoming free. So it's, I didn't have the near death experience. Um, I went through meditation, and and I can still do that um, all the time now, which makes living in this world much more palatable. This world is dust to me. It's like you get filet mignon, and then you get, you know, uh, McDonald's. It's just not the same thing, but you get this beautiful love. And I start to see that now more and more. Um, kind of a homeless man came up and and I see the Christ in him and I'm starting to see the oneness in all of us. I see, when I look at trees and nature, I see the life and the energy that's in them. It's really, it's really quite a lovely way to live. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I have to agree too that about, I, I, I've told people I have two bank accounts, one in heaven and one here on earth. And the one in heaven, I always want to make deposits of love. I never want to make a withdrawal. So when I have a, a thought of anger, an attack thought, or whatever, I immediately say, I do not want to withdraw from my, my heavenly account. I want to forgive that. I forgive myself and then forgive that person and ask Christ to recenter me in that love. And with practice, I have become more and more peaceful, more and more centered in Christ consciousness. And I've learned just to step back and let him lead the way. And more and more, I just give it to God. So that heavenly experience is, is I'm bringing that into this experience. And then I'm allowing that divine light to shine before me as grace. And that touches people. In the emergency room, you know, I dealt with a lot of people who died and in the nursing home and in um, hospice. I mean, I literally held the hands of hundreds of people that, that died. And I would always bring that Christ consciousness and say, Christ go before me. And he would bring in and bring in such peace. And it could be a trauma or someone dying of cancer, but there was tremendous peace. And then afterwards I was blessed with the vision of seeing Christ take the loved one, and I would ask to take him home um, to God. And all of the karma, all of the past, it didn't matter. Everything was perfectly washed away in that instant. 
And I always saw these golden doors, these beautiful golden doors on the right side. They'd open wide. And, and these beautiful arms would come out and just pull them all inside and they'd shut. So I'm always blessed with that vision. And, and to this day, I'm not practicing medicine now for four years, but people still call me when there's been a traumatic death or somebody's dying. And I still get that vision. And it's such a blessing. It's, it's such a beautiful thing to see. So continue the practice of working on being one with God. And then when you're there, bring it back and, and share that light with the world because the world needs it so much. So. Thank you. I, I was thinking about Rod. I was thinking about um, the divine experience and how uh, once you have a mystical experience, it becomes a portal back into the holy. And by, by looking at the portal, by looking at the experience, it reopens to an extent the experience itself. Because, because a, a mystical experience leaves a noetic knowledge inside our souls that's a permanent remembrance. And that when we train, we train the mind to look back to that spot and it becomes an opening for us. So it becomes, it becomes in my, in my own life, my, my mystical experiences um, become the focal point of my meditative life into the place, into the place of silence where, there, where, where, where language ceases to exist is, is when your, your prayer life falls away and you sit inside the silence, but your intention, you've been, as I, re as I read this morning, um, your mind falls into your heart in meditation. And when it falls into your heart, the opening where you once saw God, you still can see God. And so it becomes a, an anchor when you, you kept talking about it's a blessing to live in your life because, because by living it in your life, you reattach to the divine holy and simultaneously bring that same light through that same portal into the physical world. And so there's this, there's this duality that happens wherein you are the pivot point and that, that divine experience of mystic, that mystical experience becomes the pivot point itself. So that's inside. Um, and so I'm concurring, I'm concurring with what you said. Um, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. That was a great talk, Peter. Well, thanks Rod, you too. I thank all of you guys. Um, well, what I'd like to do now is to go to Bud and uh, see about some of the questions that have come up during this uh, uh, last uh, hour and a half, actually. I believe time really flies by when, when you're not thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we spoke about time a lot today. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had time for it. Uh, <laughs> So what have you got for us, Bud, in terms of some of the things that have come up in the chat? Got some great questions. Okay. This one is from Veronica. Is there any indication that this is an illusion? A hundred percent. A thousand percent. Not only is this an illusion. Oh, you're talking about this world. Yeah. Oh, is mm -hmm. that, that's what I'm talking about. What's she talking about? Is she talking about the illusion of, that's what I assumed. Yeah, I yes, think, I think for. Yes, this world, this world. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, 100%. Yeah, but go 100. ahead. Uh, back to, uh, I just wanted to be sure that you weren't talk, thinking that the experience was an illusion. It, 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 the, 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 yes, the 100% illusion the, that the only reality is God. That God, capital R, reality. This world, little r, not reality. Only, only heaven, only God is reality. And that this world is, I use the example of the, uh, of the Matrix movies, without the, you know, the evil machine overlord, not to ruin the movie for you, but um, it's instead a benevolent source of all life and lovingness. But the idea of being inside an algorithm, inside the, inside the experiment itself, and, and because we're inside the experiment itself, in the algorithm, we can't see that it's not real because we experience it as real but it's totally illusion. And here, here's something that, that I don't say often because people don't like to hear this, but I'm gonna agree with, um, uh, oh my gosh, Mark, um, that I don't matter at all. Right. I matter zero. 
And, and because I matter zero in comparison with infinity, right. uh, uh, the whole thing is like that. The whole, <laughs> and when I say the world, I don't mean earth and humanity and our solar system. I right. mean, our, all galaxies everywhere all the time. Right. So, and, and yet, and yet karma happens. And so, and yet my actions in the world created my treasure in heaven. And so there's a paradox here too. Um, but all of that, I think it was uh, Mark who said, or, my, or maybe it was Rod, all of that, you can't take it with you. You don't take it with you. And it doesn't matter when you get there. And I, my, my answer is 100% illusion. And I don't matter at all because I'm an illusion too. Right. I'm nobody. Who are you? Right. <laughs> you know that poem by Emily Dickinson? I do know that poem. She yeah. was she was right. She was a real mystic and of herself and a recluse as well. But yep. yeah, more, the more I study the course, the more I live, I guess you could say, in this world in this time, I realize that the analogy that the course uses is a dream. Yeah. I think a dream is really a pretty good analogy. It's, it's a dream that we're, and then look at all these dreams that are going on, billions and billions of dreams. And they're just dreams. And we awaken from that dream. This, this is what this is about. We awaken from the dream. Mm -hmm. And then it's like have a dream you had last night. Well, that was, that was strange, but okay, that's nothing going on now. <laughs> and, and you can awaken in part here. We only, yes. it's, as, as Paul the Apostle said in the Bible, you, we only know in part, then we know in full face oh, to face. Right. And, right. and so here, our mystical experiences help us to um, have a glimpse of the reality of God and the unreality of the world. Right. And yeah, that's it. Okay. I okay, would add, John. What, what, go ahead, Mar, uh, Ron. I, I would add, John, that the human body is very limited. We have five senses. And when you look at the energy spectrum, from a physical point of view, we see such a limited amount of energy. Right. Uh, it's complete deception. We don't see the whole picture. Right. And so there's, so you're already being deceived because you're limited. When you, when you're one with God, all doubt is gone. Mm -hmm. and you absolutely know that you, you can't explain that to somebody until they've tried it. But it's, it's, it's a complete knowing, it's a complete oneness, and it's, it never leaves you. It's always there, right. which is very comforting when you're going through this life that, oh, I don't have to do this. I'm going to let God handle it. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's my two cents on it. Right. Okay, uh, Bud, got another? We're going to do questions. For oh, that. we got a bunch of questions. I bet you do. Let's <laughs> pick, pick, pick another one. This one's from Elizabeth. How does one fully surrender to the one? How does your experience suggest that, that and what does it take besides readiness? It takes grace. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I was not ready to surrender. I was surrendered. Mm -hmm. The surrendering happened to me. Right. I didn't make it happen. I, I, I had been a, you know, a Catholic uh, kid growing up and also Greek Orthodox, two churches. And so I was a believer. Um, but all of that didn't make a difference. Subsequent to that, subsequent to my near-death experience, I began the practice of surrender. And there is a practice of surrender. And that's what we were talking about when we talk about meditation. The practice of meditation is the surrendering of the false self. That's, it's the, in the Christian tradition and mysticism, they call it dying the little death daily. Hmm. And so as we, as we surrender ourselves every single time, we, we stop our monkey mind, to use the colloquial term, for the thousandth time. I wish I could come up with a better one than that. But the running mind, when we stop our running mind and we fall into the heart of silence, that's where surrender is accumulated. 
we accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And as we accumulate on the action, it's our action that helps this accumulation occur. It thins the veil, the veil gets thinner and thinner and thinner, which provides a greater opportunity for divine grace to show you the truth of yourself, that you are not real and that your ego doesn't exist and that your soul is eternal and that's who you are. And so the process, we can, we can take action toward it, but ultimately uh, it's like in, in the practice of Zen, um, the la, the, w- w- you're striving your whole life to reach Satori. And, but, you, but in order to reach Satori at the very end, this thing you've been doing for your whole life, you have to surrender your Satori. But uh, you have to surrender, I'm sorry, your desire for Satori in order to attain it. But your practice through your whole life prepares you for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. The way the Course in Miracles describes it is God takes the last step. You know, you got to yeah, exactly. do the work, but then God takes, that's the grace, right? Yeah, that's the grace. And also, Jeez, really, I, I spoke for 10 minutes. I could have said it in one sentence. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go on with another question or two. <laughs> so this question is from Jadine to Peter. Can you compare or comp- contrast your first NDE with your second? Yes. Um, there are similarities and there are differences. Um, in my second NDE, and just to let you all know, I, I, and it was in 2015, and I had a widow maker heart attack, all, despite my high level of fitness at the time, because we have a genetic thing in my family. And so I had a 100% blockage in my widow maker, and I died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And where I, I live in a rural I, I don't live far from Rod, but Rod lives in the city. I live, I live in the, and I live the, uh, on the point of a, of a neck that sticks off of a peninsula that is already rural before you get to the peninsula. And so it was, by the time I got to the urgent care center, I'd already spent an, an hour, my golden hour had already elapsed by the time I was in the ambulance on the way to the main medical center catheterization lab, and I died on the way. And the, uh, what happened was the, I could hear the, the paramedic radioing in saying, we're losing him. And because I had refused a- any sort of, I had a hundred percent blockage that gave me a, a, a drug that gave me a trickle through, a 3% trickle through is what he told me. And they offered morphine for the great amount of pain that I was in, but I refused because morphine makes me sick and vomiting. And so I, I handled my pain through meditation because meditation practice can include, and mine, ha- mine has, staring at pain in your body, which creates the separation. That's a whole nother story. But you can control your pain through meditation in the moment that you're practicing it. So I was practicing my meditation, controlling my pain. When I heard the paramedic radio in, she said, we're losing him. I opened my eyes because I could still hear everything. And I looked at her and I, I saw this look you know, of panic, go to game face. And then I closed my eyes. And when I closed my eyes, because I closed my eyes because the pain came back because I stopped meditating. And so those massive elephants standing on my chest pain. And so immediately I go back into my meditation. Only when I go back inside, I'm not in meditation anymore. I'm in painlessness. I am out of my body and I'm above my body inside the tunnel. And, and the, my angel of death, my friend, my lifelong friend, the angel of death, the intelligence came, comes toward me, but this time saying, we love you. It's time to come home. Come home. It's your time. We love you. It's your time. And, and, it, and, and it came rushing toward me as I looked up at it I'm in spirit body consciousness. And, I, and it rushes toward me. And as it rushes toward me, I think, I have time to think about this. I'm not confused this time. I'll, I should add that I was completely unafraid. I've been saying since my near-death experience, I've been saying um, I, I'm not a believer. That's the first thing I say. And the second thing is I'm not afraid of dying. And so now here I am dying and I'm completely unafraid. I am completely rational. I'm very, I'm very present and I'm not frightened. And so I have time to think about it. And I think, well, wait a minute. Um, I should make sure everything's okay before I leave. When I was in the urgent care, 
I looked at my wife and I, I said to her what I'd been saying to her since the day I came back and we got married, you know, years later. Uh, first legitimate chance I get to go home, I'm going. And today's my day. <laughs> and so I turned around and I looked inside my life to see if I was, if everyone was good. And, and as I was leaving the urgent care center, my son had shown up and he was in his mid twenties and he had grabbed my hand and he leaned in and he looked me in the eye and he said, I love you, dad. And I, I found out later the next day that the doc had told him to say goodbye to me. Oh, you, your dad's dying. Better say goodbye. Last chance. So I look inside myself and I see him and I think, He's really not ready yet. He's not quite launched. And then I think about my daughter, who's a couple years older, and she's, she had just left her, her um, U.S. Marine Corps uh, husband, who came back from the war, a very broken man, very broken. And um, they had just had a baby, and she ran and had come home with a, with a not even one-year-old, a nine-month-old. And I thought, holy cow, she's not prepared for me to leave. The granddaughters definitely needs my help. And so I swung back my eye toward the angel who had receded, who came rushing back with the same message of welcome. And I just turned away and I went back inside. Wow. And uh, so similarities, differences. And now, you know, that granddaughter, she's five. Let me say this. My, my dad is in hospital again today. For about the eighth time in this year, uh, it, it, terrible thing after terrible thing, and but he's ninety, and I, I've spent my whole life trying to be present to him, and and now I've got my overlap of my granddaughter. I am I am the father figure in her life. I am I am the I am the golden uh, bampa. I'm the I'm uh, and and she's the reason I'm here. Got it. I also, by the way, had a second death experience in 2007, but it was nothing like the one because it didn't have the same trauma of letting go of the ego. Actually, I just went into a coma <laughs> as a result of a, a encephalitis. Mm. But the part was really interesting was the days coming. I remember coming out of it. I don't remember what happened because I've gone. I left. But I do remember coming back and you shared something with me that I thought was really, we both had trouble coming back into the body. Mm. And the sense that and one of the things that happened, for example, is when I came home, uh, I couldn't eat for a long time. I, I, I just, I was watching my wife and daughter eat. I thought this is the grossest thing. I mean, this, <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so hard to understand, just looking at it. I just thought this is, and we human beings all do this all the time, but there's just a lot of other. And then I thought about sex. And I thought sex is the strangest looking thing. I mean, if you think about it, you know, we, we won't go any further with that. Uh, <laughs> Although we're all thinking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what else Bud's got for us. Another 10 minutes or so, I want to come back and just a full gallery and see where we are. So this is a question from Jim. Modern physics has suggested the possibility of parallel universes. Mm. He wonders if Peter or John has a sense of whether the soul incarnates in parallel universes. Yeah, that's exactly what I think I saw when I was dead, because I was I wasn't when I could see the the immensity of my soul, um, it, 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 immense in size and length and breadth and very little tiny bifurcations of incarnations, but but they were into different worlds. They were they were into different worlds. It was. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about it in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, I think his name is Michael Pullman. Is it who wrote the 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 Golden Pullman. Compass? Paul Pullman, right? Um, he talks about multiverse, and of course, science is talking about what they call brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, right. the possibility of layers with strings through it. So, he, so, so, infinite God, infinite God creates infinitely. And our, our experience, as Rod said, is limited by our, sen our physical senses, which doesn't even pick up. We don't even pick up, you know, a tiny bit of the, of the light wave uh, of the uh, uh, electromagnetic frequency waves. 
uh, is that what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Um, how much more do we not see and cannot because of our limited nature? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know how they exist. I just saw that I was living in other places. There's a very interesting line in the Course in Miracles, which says, God is the God of the universe and of the universe of universes. And oh, when I you read that. that, you kind of go, universe of universes? What's that? Yeah. And then one day I was uh, at the kitchen sink doing dishes and there was a, a little bug that started walking across the windowsill in front. And I, a perfectly round little bug. And I looked at that little bug and I thought, that's a universe. The bug is a universe. <laughs> into itself, so to speak. You know? But if that if that's a universe, then there's universes of universe. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Green, they're all talking about not a universe, but a multiverse, which we can't even begin to. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Multiverse. But also, you know, I am my own world. As it was, I, as, that's what I'm saying about the book. Right? I am my own world. Yeah. Oh. Right. And that's true for every creature because other creatures perceive different light wave frequencies than we do. Oh, sure. They and live next now, to us, but they live in a different world from me. Yeah. Think about the, the whales and the dolphins. They can hear 40 times greater than we can, right? 20, 200, we, we hear 20,000 vibration cycles per second. They go 200,000 vibration cycles per second. It's another world. Yeah, it's another yeah. world. Another world. Uh, let's do a couple more questions, and then we'll come into a full room. Sure. This is from Marty. I feel that I've had messages from someone who has died. My question is, do those who have made the transition keep watch over us at times? Yes. Wow. Yes, I think that the most common mystical experience, and, and I can't prove this yet, but I want to be able to prove this. I spent a year and a quarter traveling around New England, preaching on Sundays in pulpit supply and in invitation. And I always asked before I preached a series of questions about mystical experiences. And my first question was always, uh, who here has ever had a visitation from a beloved deceased person? And without fail, 50% of the congregation would raise their hand, 50%. And then I would say, who here has ever told anybody about it? 50% keep their hand up. And then I say, who's here ever told anybody about it in church? Nobody. Nobody. All hands go down. So, so it led me to the conclusion that the most common experience, mystical experience, is probably that the visitation of a deceased loved one. And I've been following this idea for a long time. And so I ask in funerals, I asked at a funeral the other day, I did. I ask at funerals the same question. And in my community, people expect this from me. They all know, they all know me and they all know what I'm like. And so, and inevitably, people do. And so what happens in that kind of visitation experience Say, for instance, you believe in God in the afterlife, or say you don't. But when a deceased loved one comes to you and appears to you and it happens in, in dream states and it happens in waking states and, and telepathically communicates, because it's always telepathic, love, acceptance, joy, well-being, comfort, and it's like a download of soft boom right into you, and you shift from believing to knowing, a partial knowing, a mystical experience, noetic information lodged in your soul, to knowing that your deceased loved one still lives. And so, yes, the love, because love is eternal and, and they love you. They love you. And what happens in that experience is that the person who's in grief suddenly has a shift from deep grief to experiencing love again and understanding. And so, yes, the deceased want us not to be in suffering. And so even though both Mark and I experienced the forgetfulness, when you are in the divine presence of oneness of being, there was no Peter present. Peter cannot be present and be in that experience. And, and yet, and yet, I still saw the suffering of my parents. Mm. And so th th that kind of paradox that can exist 
the deceased love us and they want the best for us. They, and what that means is they don't want us to grieve to the degree we've been grieving. One of the main things I've noticed about <clears throat> the loved ones coming back is that to tell us that they're okay. I mean, that's the most common thing. That's of what all. it is. Yeah, it's just that's I'm fine. what it is. Yeah. They're, when my, yeah. Mother's, my mother's sister died, and sometime thereafter, she, she, in a dream, dream is very common. Very. She came to me in a dream and said that I should tell my mother that she was okay and everything was fine. That's just typical. Yep. Yeah. All right, let's do one more question and then let's go to full, full screen if we can. Sure, okay. Uh, we've got so many questions. I think this I is a, a really fun one though. This is from Jim. Many NDEers in the West report meeting Jesus when they pass mm -hmm. or they temporarily pass. Do NDEers, NDEers from other world civilizations report meeting other spiritual masters such as Krishna or Buddha? From my reading, yes. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was in constant communication with uh, an, uh, an American expat living in Malaysia. Uh, and her research uh, throughout Asia was near-death experience. And uh, in Japan, in China, in Indonesia, in India, there are, she exposed me to this information. I hadn't been exposed to it before. And people have an, their bespoke experience of God. And in India, sometimes, you know, Ganesh comes or Kali. And it's not, oh, you know, it's, they, they have their little hellish experiences too. And they have their variety of experiences. Uh, and so here's the thing, is that the, it's, there seems to be a universal message coming back with near-death experiencers. And that is the message of Jesus. Love thy neighbor as thyself, love God above all things. Love, 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 love is the, is the whole thing. The whole thing is love. And, and so we're, we're Hindus and we're Zoroastrians and we're atheists and Aborigines and we're, and we're all coming back with the same message, many of us. So every mystical experience, including near-death experience, is, and I used this word this morning, bespoke. Because of the compassion, compassion with a capital C, because of the compassion of God, because God is compassion, God approaches us where we are. And, and, and so brings the love to us in, in ways that we can grasp. And so for some it's Jesus, for some it's Kali. And, and then it gets filtered so the mystical experience that the soul remembers gets filtered through the brain and the, and the symbols upon symbols upon symbols of language and then gets contextualized in, the, in, in the, the religious tradition, for instance, of the experiencer and then gets expressed. So step away, step away, step away, step away. And, and as the mystical experience happens, it's always subjective. It's always for you alone. The message is never really truly speakable and containable inside of language. And, and, and yet the approach of, of God to us is always specifically for us, which is not to say that sometimes Jesus, that Jesus only appears to Christians. Jesus appears, like a, a friend of mine who was a, she's, a, she's Jewish, uh, um, who came, uh, 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 Paramahansa Yogananda. Come, came to her. So, you know, she was Jewish. Right. Great. Uh, I, I, Bud, you probably have a load of questions here. I don't think we can. Maybe let's, let's go back to full screen. Can we do that in just a gallery view? And just if there's anything that's really, really pressing that uh, I just like to be able, we can go over time a little bit. It's, it's eight minutes till two, but I'm sure there's no, nobody's going to object if we run past the two o'clock hour a little bit. But well, let me, let, me, let me interject a moment, please, and say that okay. if, people want to, if, if people don't get their questions answered today because we run out of time okay. and we'll have to, to stay a little bit longer, um, because this is, what, this is my compulsion, I, am okay. com I came back with the mission to do this. So, um, but they can always book a session with me and we can have a private conversation. And I posted up my website inside the chat. It should be right at the very top of the chat. I tried to be the first one in so that you can, you know, scroll right up to the tip top. And oh, great. 
Good. Yeah, can, I want to. Can you a, can ahead. you put your email in again, please, Peter? I can do that, and I will do that. Thank you. And also, I should let you know about my. Um, oh, wait a minute. Where is chat? I can let you know about my YouTube channel, um, which uh, you can just find me on YouTube at Peter Panagor. And while he's doing that, I'll also uh, see if I can go back to share screen, make an announcement as well, um, if I can. Um, I have a class beginning on the S September 22nd. We're studying the 50 Miracles Principles of A Course in Miracles. We've already gone through one through uh, 20, 25. We're going to pick up 26. Uh, through 50 and the next, uh, not this week, but beginning next week, go to our website, miraclesmagazine.org, if you'd like to do that. And that's my announcement. So I can be done with that. Um, so let's stop sharing. And I'm happy to go on too, but do you want to go into gallery view or just entertain a few more questions? Um, if people want to have a uh, gallery view is fine for questions too. Uh, I'll leave it on. I'll leave it as it is for me. Speaker, speaker view myself, but, um, right. but, uh, you have any, another questions fine too. What do you think, bud? Sure. We'll, we got more. I'm sure you do. Well, let's do a few more because I don't, if you all got to go, um, go. <laughs> and thank you for being with us today. It's been very interesting. <laughs> Go ahead, bud. Patty would like to understand a little bit more about the difference between belief and knowing. Oh, oh I can talk about that. Yeah, I could too. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, so belief and knowing. Um, do you believe in my mug? Do you believe in it? Do you need to believe in it? No. You don't need to believe in it because you know it's, whoa, you know that it spills coffee when you whack it on the outside. <laughs> now, now that coffee's real. So knowing, you know, people believe in God, but they, they don't know God. Right. The difference between believing and knowing is that I, it, my experience of God is like my experience of this cup. I don't, I don't believe in God. Uh, I don't have no faith in God and I have no doubt that, that God is the reality that there is. And it is something that's implanted in my soul as a result of my mystical experience. Knowledge. So you move from belief into faith and faith is sort of like a, um, you get some mystical experience and it mixes in in partial knowing with your belief system. And so you move from faith to uh, from belief to faith because you have a partial knowing. You have some wisdom, some noetic understanding, in a in the higher levels, and that's a mystical experience. And in, in the higher levels of mystical experience, you shift from from partial knowing. It's and it's frag. It's it's temporary. Okay, into the fullness of the oneness of God, where self itself is eliminated, and then you and then it it. It, it fills you so that, when, and, and so that when you come back into your body, that connection of fullness never goes away. It, 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 it's, it's like it's filtered through the body here, but the connection of the knowingness of God it, in the same way that I know that this is real, only it's more real. It's the capital R. So believing is an intellectual exercise of conviction, of confession, of decision. Faith is that plus some mystical experience and knowing is none of those things. It's, it's, like, it's like the difference between, another way to put it is you don't have to believe in science for science to be real, right? You don't have to believe in it. It, it, it is or it isn't. God's like that. Right. It is. The Course draws a very important distinction and makes a, a, mentions it many times, it draws a distinction between perception and knowledge. Perception is the things that happens with our bodily senses that we pick up on the world. And mm -hmm. beliefs are something which are actually weak in the sense that you can change your belief. Yep. You can believe one thing <clears throat> and then you have a conversion. You Now you believe some other thing. But knowing is, you know, you just know. There's no doubt. There's like you okay. say to somebody, are you in love? And they say, I don't know. They're not. Because if they were totally there, they would know it. 
Yeah, it's like there's a, a, a great old clip of uh, Carl Jung uh, that you can look on YouTube in 1961 being asked by the BBC if he believes in God. And Jung does this kind of pause and goes, believe in God? No, I know. I know. <laughs> it's not, it's, there's no doubt. What else? And, and, that, that, and that's been true universally for his, all history. Oh, yeah. Sure. What's wonderful about the mystical experience is that you do know, in which case there's no doubt. Right. Right. You could doubt beliefs, but you wouldn't doubt knowledge. <laughs> Bud, what else? Well, this is kind of a summation question from lots of people's similar okay, questions. And so from this perspective uh, that you have, how do you see the things that are going on in this world, mm -hmm. like climate change, like the fires in California, people dying in wars? How do we use this new perspective to view the state of the world? A big, super big question, um, mm. but it is the question of suffering. Why is there suffering in the world? And it's the, it's the question we all ask ourselves all the time. It's the human thing to do. Uh, so there's a couple things going on there. Some evil in the world is created by human beings and some suffering in the world is created by nature. And sometimes those two things overlap. The hurricane has no evil nature in it and neither does the fire, neither does the flood. Human beings, now that we've created the anthropomorphine, is that it? Anthropomorphic. No, 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 uh, Anthrocene, no. the Anthrocene, oh, I see. right? Now that we've created the Anthrocene, we've created climate change for ourselves. We've impacted the, the earth. Now remember, we are nature itself. So even in our action of, of the Anthrocene creating that, we are nature impacting nature through our decision making. So even in that sense, it's not completely separate. And humanity wars, humanity hasn't evolved really in hundreds of thousands of years. We are still the same tribal, selfish, self-interested species that we've always been with better technology. And the separation of nature from the supernature, from the uh, the godness, the, the oversoul, the mind of being, the presence, the love that pervades pantheons, panentheistically all things. That's the, that is the, the seeking that we're doing here and now. Uh, the world is in a terrible state, but you've got to remember that humanity has only been humanity for about 300,000 years. And before that, we were evolving for millions of years. We are just a, a creature on the surface of the planet. Our consciousness is inhabiting our bodies. And, and, and when, when I like to say, when I go swimming all the time, people say, oh my gosh, you swim so well. I say, well, my ancestors were all fish. <laughs> so, you know, we are, we are a species that is transitory in a galactic and ange geological scale. So all of that said, right? All of that said, there's a, an awakening going on. Right. I'd rather not focus on the negative here because humanity has remained unchanged. If you think about the bubonic plague and you think about the, you think about the bubonic plague and that was after the crusades, okay? So bad things, a long time. A lot of people suffered, people died. You were an old person when you were 30. You know, mm -hmm. so the suffering of humanity seems to be for us a new thing, but it's not. It's an old thing. What is new is that, and, I, and I've been creating a new conspiracy theory, and here it is, that, <laughs> that, that, that globally scientists, especially doctors, have been colluding and secretly conniving with God to create mystics. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> What yeah, I mean by that <laughs> is that I feel like God is in this action of medical science, bringing back, res resuscitating people and bringing them back to life and creating an army of mystics around the globe uh, who, are, who are compelled to vocalize and, uh, or to express, let's say, maybe not vocalize, but to express. All right. um, and so there's the, the, the medicals, here's the new thing in the history of the world, science 
technology developed by human brains is driving spirituality globally in, in numbers that, are, that are, are because of the compulsion for expression. By the, in the United States, we get 10 to 20 million. In the world, hundreds of millions. And we're all through, meta, through, through current technology as we're doing, as I'm doing with you right now. We are communicating on a human to human scale for the first time in history. And we're all talking to each other all over the globe. I'm having conversations with people everywhere all right. the time. And so there's a great, a global great awakening occurring. Will it stop the political strife in our country? Well, you got to remember, this is not a new subject. The, no. the political strife and racism that, you know, genocide, we founded the nation upon genocide. We then, after 150 years of, of slavery in Europe, we brought that to the shores of the, of, the, of the Americas for 350 years. This conflict of, of uh, well, I could get more details, but this conflict is not new. This conflict is old. But what is new is that, is that there is a global great awakening occurring at the largest scale that it has ever occurred in the history of the world in the midst of a global anxiety for the first time in the history of the world of this pandemic. And so I have, in, I have hope, okay? I have hope for humanity because of the global great awakening. And I have hope for humanity because I know it's from God. And I have hope for myself because I'm not from here. I'm just a visitor. And, I, and, and so my real hope for humanity is that everybody's life ends and that in everybody's life time ends for them and all suffering ends and you get the freedom of relationship of the divine and God's presence even if you're stuck in time here and it feels like it'll never end it 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 will end and and I'll I'll finish with these words of uh, bastardization of Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, if the if if the slayer and the slain think the slayer slayed the slain, then they're both wrong. Mm -hmm. There is no death, but there is oh, karma. The way the Course in Miracles expresses it, it says there is no death, the Son of God is free. Right? Exactly. And I think with regard to what's, what's going on right now, that, that there's definitely an experiential dimension to this. It's getting faster and faster in terms of the, the rate of change in time that we're experiencing. I recently read uh, Steven Pinker's book, uh, The Better Nature of Our Angels. He was a professor at Harvard University, and he pretty well shows in there how actually things are getting better all the time. You don't see that maybe in terms of the, like the pandemic and the fires and things like that. But in terms of the development and awareness of consciousness, no, there, that's, that's definitely, that keeps taking steps. And keep the, the death of the church is one very good example of it. The, because the church is really old at this point. Laws, cruel, rules, creeds, dogmas, all that sort of stuff. We want to figure this out for ourselves. We don't want to be told, right? And, and we are figuring it out. It's coming from the inside because that's the only place it can come from there. So. Exactly. All right. I think right. I'd like to weigh in on this one, John, sure. if you don't mind. Um, you know, things happen um, that we think are on the outside, and then we have feelings about that, and we decide whether it's good or bad or indifferent. Um, but what we need to do really is look at ourselves and say, why am I losing my peace over this? Mm. What is it internally that is happening in, for myself? Right. And then ask the Holy Spirit and say, um, you know, I can see peace instead of this. Show me this. What is this for? Because I don't understand it. And there is no good and bad in this world. We, mm -hmm. we say that, but that's a projection from ourselves. We decide that, oh, the, the pandemic is terrible. Well, it's, it is or it isn't, depending on what's happening for ourselves. What needs to happen instead is for, for ourselves to look at it and say, why am I seeing this? Is, why is this disturbing me? Mm -hmm. And then and then we recover our peace, ask the Holy Spirit to regain our peace. So, thanks. One of the things I think I say more than anything else to students is uh, don't let anything take the peace of God away from you. Just don't, but especially the, well, anything, but 
trivia, definitely don't let that stuff. What somebody else said, <laughs> you're going to get upset because somebody said something, uh, an insult or something. That's insane. Right. Um, Bud, you want to throw another one or two? We'll go to. Uh, is there any, any way that I, somebody yes. can ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Connor. Well, let, this is a question for Peter. Peter, um, I'm Jewish, and in the, um, as you know, in the Jewish tradition, the name for God is Hashem, which literally means the name. Mm -hmm. It is a totality. Mm -hmm. At some point, I had a love affair with Christ and a number of dreams, the last one where I married the Christ, etc. Was always something that did not feel right to me. There was always like there was an intermediary, mm. something. So my question to you is, being that you had been in the consciousness and in the awareness of the oneness, the isness, God, mm. um, why do you still need to go through an intermediary? I don't like Christ. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's all, it's all, it's, it, it's the, it's the human need for, in, in Sarajevo during the, during the last war, there's a story where uh, during the bombings, um, the mother said to the child, um, don't worry, um, God is with us. And the child said, but sometimes I need God with skin on. <laughs> I think I think lots of humanity Whoa. needs a God that they can touch, and Hashem, the the Chavye Vavye, the unpronounceable uh, name of God, is the experience of me. And so, when I came back into my life, because I experienced God had no religion beyond conceptualization, I consciously chose to go back into Christianity. As a, as a conceptual, as a tool set for conceptualizing my experience for myself. So, I had a class uh, at uh, I was a, went back to University of Massachusetts where I was an English major, and I took a class in mysticism East and West, and uh, and during this course I spoke with the professor and I said I've got this friend who had this mystical experience. I lied. I, who has this mystical experience? Um, should should he pursue uh, Judaism should, because of the no nameness of God? Should he pursue uh, Hinduism because of the multiplicity of the symbolism? He said to me, "If it's God you want, if it's God, no, if it's God your friend wants, stay in the cultural context of your life because because the mystical experience is in present is present in all of these language forms, <clears throat> all of these religious forms." And so, I consciously and he said because. If you become Jewish, you're going to have to learn Hebrew. If you're going to become, if you're going to understand Hinduism, you're going to have to learn Sanskrit and the culture. And so I chose Christianity and I adopted the language and the culture of my context in order to create a way to think about it and to speak about it. But there is no intermediary. Jesus is not really an intermediary because Jesus is a represent. It, a representation of the divine itself. So even when some loved one comes to visit you in death, they're not just coming to bring you their okayness of, of their peace in heaven. They're bringing you a portion of God. They're bringing you a portion of God. That love that you experience and that wellness that you experience, yes, it's their experience, but in its origin and its purpose and its presence is the divine itself. And so when Jesus visits people, um, they, that's where they are in their experience, where they, they need to be in order for them to get the message. But ultimately, there is no intermediary. There, when you, when, as soon as you're dead, you'll find that out. Even, even the angel that came to collect me was not just an individualized entity unto itself of, of intellect. It was a connective tissue to the divine itself. You know, in the Bible, it talks about them being messengers of God. And we think of the messenger who, you know, who leaves the kingdom and goes to the, you know, physically goes and is actually far away from God. But that's not the case. 
is that the angel is actually still in the presence of the divine oneness of being superpositioned in my presence and in the presence of God simultaneously. And so, yes, a lot of people in the evangelical end of the Christian tradition need a Jesus. In the Orthodox tradition, they land a little more on the side of the Christness, which is the, un, the inexpressible light of being. And but in the in the Western Protestant traditions, they land a little more on the Jesus side because they need their God with skin on. But as soon as they die, they're not going to have any skin. Hmm. Right. Later, in terms of the Course in Miracles, the the main word there would be the Holy Spirit. The sure. Holy Spirit is the is the is the intermediary, if you will. But then there's no disconnect between nope. the Holy Spirit and the way the course talks about the Holy Spirit said so the voice for God. Yeah. The voice for God. That's just a way of trying to put it into form, but there's no separation there. There's no division between nope. these things. Right. Nope. Zero. All right. If there's anyone like Hana would, that would like to just, they got something really pressing. And you just want to say it without going through bud. Uh, try it. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Are you and talking to me? Well, uh, you too, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have more to say. I just wanted to tell you, Peter, that uh, the way you shared your near-death experience was so extraordinary. So you have been there with chemical help and meditation mm. in some, that, that kind of level. But uh, you, really, you really conveyed the, the vibrational level of the experience. I just want to thank you. Well, right. well, thank you, because, and if, I'm, if I may, um, Jenna, that is exactly what my purpose is in life. So uh, I've spent my life learning to m be a messenger, to message. I was a congregational minister for 18 years, and then I spent 15 years on television, messaging God on commercial TV. Um, but it's always, you, you, you can put the light inside of things. You can Cezanne in his paintings, Bach in his music, Emily Dickinson in her poetry. You can, you can, a creative person can imbue my grandmother in the bread she made. What's your special ingredient? Yeah, yeah. It's love, <laughs> honey. It's love. <laughs> um, and so, but my goal is to not use an intermediary medium. My goal is to provide the presence itself because the more I came back with an extra dose and then I've had extra doses my whole life since. And then I've been practicing meditation and like a, a combination of Hatha and, and uh, uh, Vispassana yoga, um, all about my prayer life, all trying to expand this thing because the best messenger for the message is the message itself. Mm. is the presence right. itself. And so so I thank you for saying that, Jana, because I, my goal is to try to always convey, to get out of the way and allow the divine presence to touch a single soul individual or, or, or groups of people, because once it's you get touched by it, then you seek it yourself. You did get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Meditation gets you out of the way. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay. May, may, may I just second that? Sure. This is Jean. I just wanted to say too, Peter, that while you were giving your presentation, um, I really, you know, I really, really felt it. And I really like there was a, there really was a knowing within me that you know, pay attention. And I was like, you know, like spirit, Holy Spirit is speaking right through you. I mean, it was just oh, wow. like clear, clear, clear. And I'm just like, you know, like a download. I just wanted to just like drink it all in and hold it all in. So I just, I just want to thank you for oh. sharing and being such a, um, such a clear a vessel, I guess, to use an old term. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. It, it's 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 yeah. because it's not ever about me. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. This is kind of like <laughs> this is kind yeah. of like two questions in one. So they kind of go together, you know, as we're all one. Mm -hmm. When you were going through your near death experience, could you see like fragments of other souls and beings? And also, Jeff's question was when you saw the seven billion people, were they including past lives and future lives? Second question first. It was the current moment of their life uh, on earth and uh, their incarnated form. So no. And, and, uh, but I also could see the divine light inside them. I could, I could see it, it in, in, I was the, I was the, I was the particularly beloved child, but everyone was the particularly beloved child. And so we we're all like super equal. Nobody's particularly beloved, but everybody's particularly <laughs> beloved. <laughs> <laughs> but I could see that because I could see their divine light, not because I could see their lives. And what was your first question, Linda? I'm sorry. When, when you were in heaven before you came back, did you see, besides uh, seeing God, did you see other souls, other beings? I, I did not see other souls and other beings. I entered into the, into the unity. Nothing, when, when, when I was in the, when I was brought into the unity of being, nothing lacked. So there was no absence of, of other souls because all of those souls were still in the containment of the oneness of being even mm -hmm. if they were individuated on earth or individuated in heaven it right they were all e everything was there right. all of it was there and so it was uh, and yet i was still i was still individuated mm -hmm. so i, I understood I, I i understood i understood that that all that all of all of all the universes and all the, of all the beings and all of the love and all time past present and future all were here now and so the 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 the, the beings who are the beings who are dead who come to visit you in life you're not really here either you are still there you are still all of that was still there there was it was like that's where we really are. It's not right. like that's where we are. Really we really are there. And, mm -hmm. and, and as, as John was saying, we're dreaming this dream. We're in the matrix of this algorithm. We are, we are living our lives incarnate. I feel like John and I were talking about eating. And when I first came <laughs> back, eating was this crazy, crude sort of, I have to put fuel into this thing. When I was <laughs> dead, I didn't have to put fuel into it. I was just, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, so I, I, the machinations and the swallowing and, and, uh, and, and even that's unreal too. Hmm. N none of this. So uh, I, th I thought Larry maybe had a question. I saw you pop in there for a sec or. Thank you. Let me say in terms of the, in terms Thank of the you. course, the way the course talks about reincarnation, for example, yeah. it says there is no reincarnation, right? It says ultimately, the, but that's a ver ultimately is the word for it. Ultimately, there's no reincarnation. There's no past. There's no. no future. Birth into a body once or many times makes no sense. Yeah. Because it's like a, an escape from God coming yeah. into, 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 this, into the dream. The dream is something which is separate from reality. That's why it's a dream, a fantasy. It's an illusion. And we're wandering around in this illusion uh, rather than awaking from the dream. Which is why we call it an awakening. Okay, exactly. All right. Hello. Yes. Okay. Um, just a little bit of facts for everyone. There were 6.6 .6 billion people on this planet. Three to five percent have had a near-death experience. Three to five percent of the people have had a spiritual awakening. Okay. What we're what we're watching on a daily basis is that spiritual awakening. I want to thank John and Peter. I still am amazed how you both came together to put this on today. I want to thank you both so much. It was it was wonderful. I know both individuals outside of this. And the Course of Miracles is the future of what our belief system should be about. Because, John, thank you for reading lesson or quoting the top of lesson 163. There is no. no death. The Son of God is free. Right. 
everything that we watched about two days ago, 9-11, I thought as I'd watched the names being read, those people didn't die. Right. They transitioned back to God. Right. I had that so feeling. The sooner, the the sooner that we start to understand that and embody that, the better off we'll all be. And in that reading of all those names, there was every race, creed, color, religion, belief system, everything. 9-11 was the beginning of the Great Awakening. Mm. And we're, we're embodying it today. Mm-hmm. This, this corona thingamajiggy or whatever it is, I don't have a lot of time for it. Yes, mm. people are transitioning, but, but where are they transitioning to? They're going home. Right. They're going home. That's what it's all about. We all go home. We all go home. One of the most common, Rod could talk more about this than I could, but one of the most common things that people say on a, on a deathbed is, I want to go home. Yeah. I want to go home. <laughs> Where did Dorothy want to go from The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, exactly. Simple movie. She wanted to go home. Yep. Alice in Wonderland, too. And the boy yep. in the, the polar Hi. Era. <clears throat> When we t- when we talked, um, we were talking about how the immune system is activated in our world now. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, I have a little poem. for. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Um, it's called, I call it wonderful. Okay. Out of mighty companions, our call is heard. In trust through boot camp, we arise together. Pure love are we as links of light. In overflow of all we receive. Journey of heart knows its way. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Amen. I guess that's it. Let, well, let's, let's, let's close. You know the way I like to close, if I can, is, uh, and then we can go into full screen and just sort of say goodbye. I want to read this as a closing, okay? And by the way, Peter, there's something in this that you said. Uh, there's actually a phrase when you were talking that from this prayer, that you quoted, Peter, and I'll I'll point it out after I read it. I'm going to read it, and the rest of you, you could, with your mics off, you might say it out loud to yourself. This is on page 350 from the uh, FIP edition of The Course in Miracles. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions, and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the mind which you created and which you love. Amen. And now let's actually, let's go to full screen and then we can say our goodbyes in full screen. So John, Peter, Rod, Mark, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an absolute amazing experience. Uh, we've enjoyed it very much. And thank you in particular, Peter and Rod and Mark for helping me out here today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so great. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 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 <laughs> right, I see you right on. Uh, Jeff, it's good guys seeing you guys again. Thank you, you too. Oh, good Thank to see you, Don. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you Jake, soon. Martha. Love you guys. Yeah. Bye.